the encampment back to Princeton. Actually, for his second talk today, he gave a, a talk in the step series um, earlier. Um, I first met Dan about 20 years ago at Harvard when I was a graduate student, and he was already a dynamic force there as a postdoc. He returned as, um, to study energy, um, making a transition from physics um, that he had um, done earlier. He left Harvard and came to Princeton at that point and became one of the critical early directors of the STEM program and um, recruited me to Princeton um, and then sadly left about four months later for a position to intern down at Berkeley in the Energy Resources Group where he's been um, ever since, so with a short break um, recently, to uh, work at the World Bank. He's currently the class of 1935 Distinguished Professor of Energy at the University of California, Berkeley, with parallel appointments in the Energy and Resources Group, the Goldman School of Public Policy, and the Department of Nuclear Engineering. He's also the founding director of the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory, co-director of the Berkeley Institute of the Environment, and director of the Transportation Sustainability Research Center. In uh, 2011, he served as the World Bank Group's Chief Technical Specialist for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. And the aim of um, that program is to enhance the operational impact of the bank's renewable energy and energy efficiency activities while expanding the institution's role as an enabler of global dialogue and moving energy development to a cleaner and more sustainable pathway. This is something that's been a key aspect of Dan's research, I think, since his time here, was the interface between energy, environment, and development. Title today, Building a New Dialogue of Energy and Sustainability for the 21st Century, I think captures and pulls a lot of that together. He's been an author, co-author of 12 books, written more than 300 peer-reviewed journal publications with a variety of um, different co-authors, and testified many times in the U.S. state and federal congressional briefings. He's a frequent contributor or commentator in international news media, including Newsweek, Time, The New York Times, The Guardian, Financial Times. You can see him on YouTube. I think shortly you'll be able to hear him talk about um, solar, solar energy on NPR. We're lucky that he was able to reschedule his interview for that um, from today till, I think, tomorrow. Wednesday now. Wednesday now, okay. So you have a little breather between the fly back to California. Um, I'm really glad to have him back on campus. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> well, thank you all for the chance to talk. And being here really does feel like uh, an opportunity to give back. Um, when I came here uh, within the school, Frank von Hippel and Don Stokes were the ones that convinced me to come, and Rob Sokolow and others. Um, so told me how amazing it was here, and they were absolutely right. And I distinctly remember doing my best to, uh, to convince and recruit Denise to, to come here and think that it was, it was going to be a great thing for the school. So I'm really pleased to see where things have gone. And I see that that step has grown amazingly in a whole variety of programs and ways. And so in, in realizing I've only given one talk back here since I left 15 years ago, um, I broke all good convention in thinking about, let me focus on a given topic. And so what I fear I'm going to do is try to be, do a, a big smorgasbord of the things that we've been engaged with, almost all of which started here. And so I see Bob. I'm delighted to see you here. Um, we talked about you at length this morning at noon um, in terms of what the, the four horsemen of clean energy taught us and the things that we taught. In fact, uh, I don't know if it's, is it took all 304? The undergraduate science technology course, or has it moved on? Okay. So the course that I taught on uh, science, technology, and public policy with a huge energy focus, I inherited from something that Rob and Bob and Frank had put together, taught it in this room, and have used versions of it to this day. And actually, one of the biggest worries I have is it's remarkable how much those early papers remain the th key things we haven't solved, which means I fear that we haven't done a whole lot to advance the field since this really key set of papers in the 80s and 90s. In fact, maybe the most fun course I teach now at Berkeley is called Environmental Classics, where we rotate through a series of mainly books, but a couple key papers. Um, Amory Levin's early paper, The Road Not Taken, the Wages paper, a variety of other ones. And we read both the, the original items, critiques that came out when they were written, and critiques that came out much later. And interestingly for me, 
the only book that remains constant. There's a lot of papers that remain constant in the classic uh, the sort of the canon of, of things, but only Silent Spring of books remains an absolute fixture in the course year after year. And I wonder about it. It's not just the amazing quality of her writing, but the degree to which Rachel was living a story about these issues um, as she was writing and she knew, um, as we, if those of you have seen the American Experience movie about Rachel Carson's life, know that as she was campaigning, she knew her end was in sight. Um, and so she was thinking about a lot of the pollution issues um, as, as she campaigned on national TV and engaged in a whole size, a series of large-scale debates. And so what I want to try to do today is, again, give a feeling for the types of themes that, at least in my research group, motivate students to debate constantly. Should they remain in academia? Should they go to government? Should they go to private sector? Should they found NGOs? And so I'm going to try to, to hopefully coherently bounce back and forth between all of those areas as we sort of talk about some of the projects. And so what I'll do to launch things is just to give a little bit of an introduction to our laboratory because it is something that came very much out of the opportunities that first uh, Dean Henry Bean in here and then Michael Rothschild uh, gave to me. In fact, Mike Rothschild, um, the, 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 the dean when I left, told me at one point that my job was to do and his job was to say no when I crossed some boundary. And anything where he didn't say no was fair game. And that was pretty remarkable advice. And he gave us a half of a building to let us kind of go play. And it was really a remarkable time. The students and faculty I work with then, we still collaborate very closely with. And so it really, uh, it really changed the dialogue for us about these issues. So what I'll try to highlight within the academic research field, within theory, um, within dialogues to government, to civil society, um, is what are the tools that we now need to, advance, to alter the dialogue around um, clean energy or sustainable energy futures. Um, and it shouldn't be any surprise that one would conclude with a statement, um, this is essentially the bumper sticker for the whole talk, that the instruments that we need merge innovation both scientifically and technologically with innovation on a policy landscape to basically recreate the industrial revolution that took roughly 150 years the first time into a very few decades. You know, we have roughly 37 years if you want to take the 2050 target seriously. And I'll come back to that uh, statement a number of ways. And so one of the things that our lab has tried to do is to make sure that the projects we were taking on within the research community were ones that we could see, not necessarily an endpoint, so it wasn't applied research always, but we could see a way that it would engage in critical issues. And so one opportunity that's come up over and over again is something that Secretary Clinton first offered us um, when President Obama founded something in 2009 called ECPA, which is the Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas. And while I always fancied myself as a researcher whose field work was largely in Africa, the opportunity came up in the Americas, and so we've taken advantage of it. And so since the first ministerial level meeting around energy issues for the Americas, uh, that were the first one was, was hosted by President Obama in the Caribbean in 2009, there's been a series of these meetings in 2010. Then Secretary of State Clinton introduced me as the first energy envoy in this area. But it turned out that a certain um, envoy working in the Middle East thought that envoy term was taken. And so uh, the term you'll now see is fellow in clean energy. Uh, there was one, me initially, and now there's about eight fellows in the clean energy space. And we've done a variety of projects from working on the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. I think my pointer is uh, kaput. Um, but this is uh, heading to one of the field sites to look at off-grid, small-scale community energy systems. And this is in the US Embassy in Managua giving a talk about this to one of the subsequent meetings of the ministerial gang. Or oh, am I sounding hoarse? No. Oh, OK. Um, and so one of the interesting outcomes of this was a realization that probably didn't take much research, that we have very few ongoing forums for international partnerships. We have lots of neat collaborations, one-on-one, -on -one, one -on -one, a few at a time. But we don't have programs that allow 
scholars who want to work on the science, the engineering, the economics of energy in the Americas to collaborate on a regular basis. And in fact, we have a, 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 a two graduates here of a program that Earthwatch, which is essentially um, short-term environmental Peace Corps or environmental travel, uh, we worked on it in East Africa and we worked on some very low-tech technologies, solar cookers, as a start in this field. Uh, what, uh, one thing that came out of this dialogue that Secretary Clinton uh, hosted was a forum to allow that. And so to tell your colleagues, this is a clear advertisement, um, the Fulbright program set up three years ago a new initiative to link not students but mid-career researchers across the Americas on projects where they do their own work, sort of full Fulbright a year's uh, award, and they, if you're a scholar from America, from the US, you have to spend at least three months in Latin America or the Caribbean. If you're a scholar from Latin America or the Caribbean, you have to spend at least three months in the US partnering with some other research group. And you worked on your own project, and then you also work on a team project with some of the other fellows, and there's 20 fellows per cohort. That worked so well the first two years that the next two years have been um, uh, expanded as a new collaboration. And so I encourage anyone interested in working on clean energy in the Americas to apply for these really generous awards. It's a two-year, uh, $30,000 to $40,000 fellowship from, from the Fulbright uh, f Foundation to work not on your own, but in a team of four to five researchers on one of these topics. Um, off-grid, small-scale renewable energy systems, the social and behavioral aspects of adaptation to climate change, uh, measuring climate change and developing metrics for, for that level of change, the impact of climate change of biodiversity, um, and then the nexus really of food and water security. And these are fellowships that you win for two years. You can be an academic or you can be a professional with more than five years work experience, um, half funded by the US, half funded by the Brazilian government, around themes that you cannot do as an individual researcher. Uh, everyone who picks one of these themes will be paired um, or teamed in a group of five researchers, one Brazilian, one US, and then the other uh, three spots will be for people across from the rest of the Americas. And again, this is just an example of finding a platform to build capacity in, in these types of areas. And so, again, tell your students the due date isn't until late uh, March for these fellowships. And it's the first time we've ever offered multi-year fellowships with both State Department and uh, Ministry of Education uh, uh, Brazilian state sponsorship. Another thing that we've worked on that's been a way to facilitate work in this area is a journal that we founded. It's now eight years old. And Dan Rubenstein here from Ecology and Biology is one of our board members. And it's a online, it's one of the early open access online journals. It has done wonderfully in terms of the academic ranking of, of the, uh, the ISI ranking for the academics in the room. But it's one that has no page charges. If you're from developing countries, you publish for free. If you're from a, a developed country, there is a page fee. Um, and the goal of the journal, usually but not always they successfully followed, is to get articles that are submitted into print in 90 days. We had an article recently assessing the view of researchers who worked on environmental issues about climate change. They examined the, uh, the, the perception of researchers in this field. Um, and found no surprise that there was a very high belief that climate change, as we, as we I believe we understand it, um, is in fact going on. President Obama or President Obama's uh, assistants tweeted it out, and the article had 100,000 downloads in 75 hours. And so it's an interesting way to get the story out there. And what I found is that graduate students, people thinking about tenure and various academic things, people thinking about next career stages, a journal that can get articles out in 90 days is immensely valuable in terms of getting the communication out by what they're doing. The other part of the story is that we've tried very hard to engage on what science and analysis you need to form good policy. And we have not always been successful. There are some policies I've pushed hard for that are less than ideal, shall we say. And so, so thinking about that kind of mix of things, um, our lab has been working very hard 
over the last, ever since I've been at Berkeley, on working towards federal renewable energy standards for the non-energy experts in the room, an RPS, a renewable portfolio standard, a, a, a content requirement by percentage for renewable energy in the mix, not the same strategy as they use in most European countries with a feed-in tariff, a subsidized amount per unit. We have not had traction yet at the federal level, despite some interesting promises from senators chairing the committees. Um, but in California, we've had a process that has worked remarkably well. And I'll spend a fair amount of time uh, dwelling on that. A policy that supports California's Assembly Bill 32, our greenhouse gas law, and I see several people in the room who have studied it in detail, um, is a requirement that's essentially the fuel's equivalent of a clean energy standard, so a equivalent of the renewable portfolio standard, and that is to say our fuel mix in California needs to decarbonize by 1% a year by finding cleaner fossil fuels, if possible, or mixing in larger amounts of sustainable biofuels with the sustainable, a complicated part of the story, or electricity or hydrogen. And in fact, I'll get to later on, the electricity and hydrogen part of this piece after some interesting fits and starts, is now going remarkably fast. A policy that was blocked by, uh, by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, no thank you to them, um, is something called Property Assessed Clean Energy that Scientific American rated as the number one innovation in 2009. And it basically says, lend property owners money if they invest in efficiency and renewables because there's both a private benefit and a public one. It's worked quite well. And a number of these things have resulted in spin-off companies. And I'll come back to Enphase in particular as an example. But Renewable Funding is a company that exclusively uh, manages the finances of PACE programs around the country. Right now, it's managing them in nine states. A company that came out of the efforts to develop autonomous renewable energy called PowerHive is a company that builds and operates mini grids in Kenya. Um, and is now expanding to Indonesia. And then a large-scale effort in partnership with National Geographic and Shell has been to run a series of fairly high-profile forums on key issues, the future of biofuels, energy in the Arctic, et cetera. And so this has really been the context that we've tried to build a story. And so without doing it at great length, because many in the room have studied the IPCC process, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change process in detail, let me just highlight one of the real disconnects. And so these are the graphs that I grew up on, if you will, when I moved into energy. Um, and this is just showing um, surface temperature and, um, and, and sea level rise and in the northern hemisphere snowpack and just showing the trends over time. And depending what your tolerance for noise in the data is, you can draw your own point at which point you think that we have crossed a, crossed a point where you're 50%, 70%, 90%, 100% convinced climate change is real. This is sort of the language that most of us in the energy and sustainability field come out of. A technical or engineering background, uh, we move into this area in a variety of ways. Not everybody, but, but certainly but the, the majority of the students who come into my program certainly come from that background. And what's instructive is that we've really fallen down on translating that into a process. And so again, you can each draw your own individual line where you think that we have crossed that threshold. I draw the line pretty early on um, in terms of where I see a pretty clear trend. But it's instructive to pull out the most key statement from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that shared the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore in 2007, because there was one Gore and several thousand members of the IPCC. I've been told that we were all micro-Gores is the unit. Um, but if we draw vertical lines for when those reports came out and what their strongest statement was, the first report, the first assessment report came out in 1990, and the strongest statement the group could collectively make, and I see several authors in the room, um, was unequivocal detection of, of human impact on climate is not likely for a decade, i.e. we have 10 more years of employment. The second assessment report, 1995, the strongest statement, the balance of evidence suggests discernible human activity in one word, and that took over eight hours to negotiate, that word being discernible. Um, so we're moving along. Um, the third assessment report, there's a year of slippage, you'll notice here, in terms of getting the report out, 
Most of the warming in the last 50 years is likely, with a probability, two-thirds, uh, due to human activities. The fourth assessment report in 2007 noticed a little additional slippage, supposed to be every five years, but not quite. Uh, most of the warming is now very likely 90%. Uh, due to human activity, warming will most strongly and most quickly impact the global poor. And it's that second part of that statement that I find in many ways the most interesting. Climate change, the story is getting clearer and clearer, but now there's effectively a normative statement there about the global poor and not the poorest nations, but the poor around the world. And so it's an interesting evolution of the thinking, and we are um, 2011, one of the interim reports that provides data for these big reports, supposed to be every five years. Um, this is one that I co-chaired the policy chapter for, the special report on renewable energy, what a nerdy title, um, concluded that 80% clean energy in the global mix, that's roughly the target we need to shoot for or more, um, was possible if. And that if statement is one that only a old Fortran programmer could love, because it's an if-then statement that it literally is pages of clauses. If we do this, if we do that, if we understand policy, and it goes on and on. That's where we are in terms of it is technically possible. In one transliteration, that is a statement that the basic story in the wedges picture is true, that there is enough of a technological basis to begin, if not to complete the, the, the transition that we need to do. Um, and the fifth uh, f assessment report that is being released now started, the, the, tech, the scientific report, the scientific part came out in the fall, and the next parts will come out in the coming weeks, um, highlighted that warming is clearly 95% or more caused by human activity, and the, the equivalent versions of these statements that get more and more normative will be appearing in the later reports in the coming weeks. And I highlight this, and I kind of dwell or waste a lot of time on it, given that many of you know the details of these laboriously written um, doorstop size volumes, is that the translation between the technical narrative and the, and, and the, and the, and the prose narrative has been a place that we collectively who work on energy and climate and sustainability have so far failed. We have not made this translation anywhere near compelling enough to get the kind of action that we should have had long ago. So we have not had our, whatever is our aha moment, our Carl Sagan speech, our go to the moon speech, whatever you want to call it. We have failed to, tra to translate something which is very clear into the kind of action that we should be doing. Um, so again, just to put the picture into context a little bit before we get into some of the work in the different areas, um, this is a version of the, this is, this is the US greenhouse gas emissions history, so roughly linear growth in emissions. Um, a business as usual forecast as made by our Federal Energy Information Agency. Both President Bush and the Chinese government have intensity-based targets, a greenhouse gas intensity of a dollar uh, or, or yuan of, of GDP. And that's, of course, interesting because it may be an improvement, but nature, I don't really think, cares how intensive we are. It cares about total emissions. And so the 350.org group and others who are doing the math are highlighting our total carbon emissions budget, not our intensity, but it's an interesting step. If we had adopted fully the Kyoto Protocol, we would have had to bend that curve to pass through that little yellow triangle, which we obviously did not do. And what I summarized before from the IPCC, that says that by roughly mid-century, we need to be down in this uh, green zone. So any of us can connect the lines, and there's lots of groups that build models of the energy system in various ways. And so one particular version, maybe you can connect the dots, um, maybe getting back to our 1990 baseline, that's the that, that's the starting point of, uh, of our emissions reduction. And of course, we've grown since then. So if we got back to that by some point in the future, that would be a good start. Um, and then you know, could connect the dots down there and go from, from here down to um, the 2050 point. So that's the, the climate solution story that, that, that Rob and Steve laid out in one, one version of the picture. And so there are various approaches to that. The European Union, until they pulled back 10 days ago and basically uh, gave up the ghost, at least for the short term, in terms of what were initially very aggressive targets. European nations individually 
had to pass through different aspects of this uh, blue box. And so Denmark and Germany have, have targets that are the bottom end, um, and countries that are doing less are have the high end. But the goal was to pass through that box. Um, and that's the picture of, of, of their path down to, to get through that point. And there's a whole variety of pieces of the story. Uh, one of the luminaries who helped found the group I am in at Berkeley, Art Rosenfeld, um, famously drew a version of the graph that every student in the room has dissected and trisected in a whole variety of ways. And it was the same sort of story. There's a business as usual path. At one point, there were plans to have a nuclear reactor roughly every five to 10 miles along the California coast. And we now have one remaining reactor of which the governor has asked me to remove from our models 10 years uh, before anyone talked about when it would need to be decommissioned. So there's a uh, very strong non-nuclear um, path in, in official government of California. There are some technology groups that want to uh, restart nuclear dramatically. Um, but essentially, this, um, this triangle or this wedge of, um, of planned energy generation capacity based on expected growth is a path that um, Art Rosenfeld and, and many others uh, highlighted we may not need if we can be more efficient and if we can change our system. And so um, getting rid of that growth is, 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 where, is where Rob and Steve, I think, really galvanize thinking on these issues. In California, there is lots of debate about our, is this graph accurate? And there's endless papers dissecting pieces of it. Um, but the canonical um, uh, truth according to, uh, to uh, sitting officials in California, not counting these debates about are they doing the math right, is growth in the overall California, uh, overall US economy in terms of energy use per capita, and then the kind of picture of this decoupling that you saw in that early graph made by Art Rosenfeld um, in, in, the, in the 70s. And so that's kind of a picture of, of where we're going. And, um, California has quite remarkably kept energy use per capita quite constant over decades of technological change. There's a whole bunch of features that tie into that story. Um, and versions that kind of highlight both what's possible and how to be really creative and innovative could go on forever. But one version I love to do, just to encapsulate it in a very quick picture, would be this is the conference, this is the Moscone Center. And those of you who go to the AGU meetings have been on this floor. Um, and what you see is exactly at a point when um, they were retrofitting away from the old incandescent lights over, over on the right to new T5 lights on the left. And the interesting part of the story, I would say, isn't just that they chose to be more efficient. That's uh, basically California building policy requires that. Um, but not only did they do that, but they saved enough money on, on retrofitting to smaller and more efficient heating and ventilation systems that the savings, which admittedly they needed someone to bank the savings, and this is a key part of the failing. They didn't save enough money to have $400,000 a year in the bank, well, to have $400,000 in the bank year one. But the auditor of the building, which is the city, um, said, we see you're on a path to save this. We will loan you the money that you will save. And so the city could have banked the money or bought yachts, as certain other universities have done down the street from me. I won't mention Stanford by name. Um, but what they did was that they turned that money around, and they invested it in a rooftop solar system that at the time was the largest single PV array in the United States. Technically, there was a bigger array um, in South Davis, California, with the wonderful name PVUSA, photovoltaics for utility scale application, but most of the array didn't work. And so this was the largest array for a while. It was 6 tenths of a megawatt. That is now trivially small. To put it in perspective, the radio show that Denise talked about that I'll, that I'll be on, this is on point, that I'll do on Wednesday, is because Dignitaries from all over California and DOE and elsewhere were taken to a small town on the Nevada-California border yesterday and today to inaugurate the 475 megawatt Solar One facility being uh, done by Bright Source Energy. So uh, just a huge, remarkable scale up in operation. And a really interesting feature that gets lost. I mean, everything I've told you so far, every course on energy covers in gory detail over and over again. A piece of the story that does not get, co get covered in gory detail, and I don't understand exactly why, is this. 
The household electricity costs in the US on average in 2011, the most recent year to which all of the data has been standardized, is that despite this investment in clean energy, the average energy bill in California is 30% less than the energy bill in the country overall. So that mixture of efficiency and renewables hasn't just cleaned the mix. It has saved ratepayers money. California has the fifth highest electricity costs per kilowatt hour in the country, but it has one of the lowest electricity bills per capita. By being efficient, by mixing in technologies, it's an interesting story. And in fact, you see how dramatic it is, given that we need that 80% decarbonization, the, electri the household electricity emissions are a third in California, the country overall. So it's a remarkable difference. You get not the carbon, you, you get carbon savings and you get financial savings. That story is again not the piece that you hear anywhere near often enough. This you will probably hear a lot of now because this is the uh, th this is from the state of California's official draft plan for how to extend the greenhouse gas law. Let me just highlight a little bit of that. So the California's Greenhouse Gas Law, Assembly Bill 32, or the Pavli Nunez uh, Global Warming Solutions Act, California never minces words on the grandizing titles, um, is to get off of the black line as historical data, and the gray is that business as usual path that I've shown in several of these graphs. And the green line is what AB 32 requires, and that is to get back to the 1990 baseline by 2020, from which we then need to cut 80%. So this is just a down payment on this transformation. But interestingly enough, California is on or ahead of schedule um, to get back to the 1990 baseline. And because of the way the process worked, the bill does not go beyond 2020. Our greenhouse gas bill, as written, actually says nothing about what has to happen after 2020. Governor, first Governor Schwarzenegger, then reaffirmed by Governor Brown, said that our target is an 80% reduction from the 1990 baseline. But no legal enforcement, this document, which is now being circulated, certain to be challenged in court, is the state's official signed off by the head of every agency. It's got all the seals and things you could want on it. And it is taking our 2020 goal as a down payment on a process to do with that red curve I showed you to get that 80% reduction. So there's a lot of ways to think about the pieces of that story. One of the ones that I find really a nice, uh, eloquent way to look at it is something that was produced by Jane Long, who was, a, who was the director of the Energy and Carbon Program at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And her version of the picture is to say, if we think about California's emissions as a box where greenhouse gas intensity is one dimension, and the other one is the mixture of fuel and electricity. As the other dimension, if we remained on the gray path, appropriately named, um, that we would, in 2050, be emitting about 830 megatons of, of CO2. We both want to squeeze this box down. We want to shift. Um, and we want to be more efficient to reduce the total we need, and we also want to shift away from fuels to electricity for a variety of reasons they're, they're cleaner. Um, and we also want to electrify the system overall. So we squeeze the box this way, and then we shift the whole box to have more and more electricity in our overall mix. And then we want to squeeze down and we want to crush the intensity of greenhouse gas emissions so, for example, by sustainable biofuels, if they exist, an interesting question, and by moving towards a greener, greener electricity, so getting rid of coal and, and carbon emissions from them at least, um, leads us to a box, which is our new final target. And so that's kind of a nice way to think about where we need to go to get that target done, and that box is 20% of the overall, et cetera, et cetera. I mentioned the Ivanpah project. Uh, you can go see it now. Dignitaries from across uh, the state are there right now having a big party. And you can see it's three of these big concentrating solar uh, fields. It's on the border with Nevada. Um, it's an interesting story in itself, but I won't get into it. It's not an ideal location in terms of the grid. It's actually quite um, poorly connected to the major energy centers in the state. 
That was a site that was picked to minimize ecological issues. There was a big brouhaha over the desert tortoise and various things, but it is the world's largest um, solar thermal facility, and it is now functional as of 48 hours ago. The world's largest thin film solar project is also in California in Riverside County, and it is a less efficient, for those of you who are not solar experts, a less efficient cells, but much less material, um, and it's another um, world's largest facility in the state. The world's largest wind farm is currently in Kern County, and world's largest wind farm is a bit of a mis is, is a bit definitional. California always picks itself to look great. Um, there are larger areas of wind farm, but as a contiguous wind farm, it's the largest one. And California has things like the most solar homes installed. In fact, right now, roughly 70% of all photovoltaics installed on residential rooftops in the country is in California. New Jersey and California dominate the national picture in this area. Um, and so with our solar neighborhoods going in, I'll get back to those things as we go. All of those things have contributed towards being on a chart to be, meet those goals. And something that only Elon Musk at this point can claim that he thought would happen, the largest single manufacturing facility in California is now Tesla vehicles. No one thought a while ago that vehicle manufacturing in the U.S. was going to be on an upswing. And nobody thought with high land prices and high labor costs and things, that California's biggest manufacturing would be vehicles. So that's a remarkable series, and that was meant to be a real quick run through of a variety of big picture statements. And the kind of things that have established really interesting scientific and technical goals have not always been driven by scientists and technologists, which shouldn't surprise you, but the, the level of them is kind of interesting. So one feature of California's plan was something they borrowed directly from what the Netherlands were working on. And that was to say that by 2020, the all new homes had to be net zero energy. Now it turns out net zero energy, borrowing from what happened with the uh, Princeton efforts um, in the 70s to think about what net zero homes would be. It's not exactly net zero. There at one point net zero meant 40% below baseline. Don't ask why. Um, now, net zero means over the course of a year, the home should generate as much energy as it consumes. And so this is meant to be a pile of, uh, effic uh, of, of, of efficiently uh, insulated ducting and piping. So make the homes as efficient as possible and then have generation. That goal we know how to do now. Lots of homes in California are near or at that goal today. Again, there's roughly 110,000 homes in California that have solar on the rooftop. And some fraction, not all of them, are close to that net zero point. Ours happens to be only because my wife and I, um, I think we mitigate our disagreements through the thermostat. I walk by and turn it down. She walks by and turns it up. And we solve these things this way. Um, but this is a goal that's not a stretch. We know how to do it now. Governor Schwarzenegger, when he called a bunch of us in, said, well, this is fine. I saw a home in, um, in the Netherlands that can do that. And he told us about his home in Austria could do it as well. And so without asking the technical community, by consulting with the quite thoughtful and very powerful head of our Public Utilities Commission, at the same time this goal went in, this goal went in as well. Commercial buildings by 2030 must be net zero energy. We have no idea how to do this today. We can do it for a particular building here or there, the Condé Nast building, this and that. But in terms of the amount of energy you need for bigger office buildings of, of variable flooring, et cetera, this is, to put it kindly, a stretch goal. We don't know how to do it, but hopefully we will learn how to do it by getting along the path um, of learning about residences. And you can be sure that there'll be parts of the state that as 2020 gets closer will realize that it's difficult, it's expensive, their homes in foggy areas. And so there will be different exceptions and things that come into the story. But it is an interesting pairing of things that the technical community would say, yeah, this is a fine goal to do. And then governor pushed ahead and said, let's do this. As an example of part of this process, many people assume that the way we will make those homes net zero energy is to follow the so the famous learning curve that Bob Williams and others have worked on for a, for a long time in terms of thinking about what empirically do we get by 
um, by investing in research and deployment and time after time, and many researchers um, have followed in, in Bob's uh, footsteps, myself included, to examine the details of the so-called learning curve. And in broadest brushstrokes, it's every time you double the number of widgets constructed, um, you get roughly a 20% drop in, in price. So it's very compelling. The wind version of this curve is a little shallower. There are some technologies that seem to have it for a while, and then it peters out, as you can imagine. There's a lot of debate about this, and, and there's an entire subfield based around building and analyzing these curves for geoengineering, for fuel cells, for flow batteries, for solar, for wind, for gas turbines. It is a cottage industry. Within the solar field, we can do it for crystal and silicon wafers, and there's another curve coming along for thin film, and I've showed you both crystalline and thin film. And in thinking about this process, one of the interesting stories in an area where the scientific and engineering community need a much more interesting dialogue with the economics community is that what's listed on here very qualitatively are a whole series of individual innovations that were significant at the time and contributed to various degrees to pushing us down that curve. Over the last few years, there has been an incredible change in the world of solar. Prices have fallen dramatically due to a combination of research that's been done to give us technologies that look very promising and dramatic scale up in manufacturing. Manufacturing largely in Asia, but not exclusively. Japan was really the first large scale uh, mover and shaker in this field, then Germany and now China, and now we're starting to see some manufacturing elsewhere. But each of these innovations come from different research labs, public, private, university, um, government labs. And one of the features which is happening right now with this remarkable drop in cost is that many companies that people were banking on to make further innovations are going bankrupt. One of my favorite companies in California called Mia Soleil that looked very, very innovative, couldn't compete, went out of business. And there's a whole series of companies so one question is, if we need these sets of innovations to keep driving us down a cost curve, are we going to have the companies left after we've seen the biggest change in the price of solar we've ever seen? In the last couple of years, the market's been growing by 50% or more per year. Prices have dropped dramatically, so much so that the US Department of Energy established a so-called sunshot goal to look like the moonshot. And that was to take us from where we are today, price-wise, depending where you buy and how you do it, from uh, a, uh, a little over a dollar uh, per watt for the solar module. And so when you combine it with all the rest of the hardware, a couple dollars a watt, down to a dollar a watt by 2020, and this curve kind of highlights that we're not far from a point where depending what state you're in, that solar would be, um, would be roughly competitive uh, directly with the, with the incumbent prices of energy. Part of that story, one I won't go into in detail here, is to look at what the evolution of different countries has been. And so if we kind of look at a polar plot for each country, where these are the four biggest players in the solar field. And so the share of the market, the share of global patenting, and the share of manufacturing are represented in two snapshots in 2000 and 2010. And for example, the United States, as you can see, a heavy player in patenting, and so one measure of innovation, not such a big um, player in terms of market share or um, in manufacturing, although forecast to rise dramatically. China, essentially a non-player in all of the areas in 2000, now the global dominant manufacturer of solar, and depending which of the deployment programs um, one looks at China right now is potentially going to be a huge deployer of solar in Inner Mongolia. There's various programs. So you see China has, has, has a foot in all areas, but is just very dominant in overall manufacturing. Uh, Japan, huge early leader that really carried this field while no other country was playing a big role. Big market share in the year 2000 and big manufacturing. Now much more modest in each of them, although not, not zero in each. And then Germany. Um, that was very, very strong in innovation patenting in 2000, 
has uh, set up some of the most aggressive renewable energy, clean energy laws in the, in, the, in, the, in the world. And now Germany is a huge market share and is a market share right now, which is in a great deal of turmoil and jeopardy, where there are huge exposés and debates about has Germany overpaid for energy? Have they made, have they made electricity a luxury good? One version of how much the world has changed is to say, if we look at the price of electricity in the United States, and I've just done in this graph the average cost across the whole country. You could do any state you want. But this is the average cost of electricity, constant dollars, um, going back to 1990. And if you take the price of gasoline over the same period of time, and if you take the average electricity use for an average American home, and the average uh, amount of uh, miles traveled in the, in the average vehicle, and you add up that as your conventional energy budget, say 10,000 miles a year of driving and a certain amount of electricity consumed per month, you get this line here in terms of the annual fuel cost. And if you look at putting solar on your rooftop or solar on your rooftop and buying an electric vehicle, leaving off the capital cost of the vehicle, because now there are electric vehicles that are roughly comparable, um, to conventional vehicles, we are now at a point where if you had the money up front, you actually save money overall by buying electric vehicle and electrifying your roof. And that is a remarkable point. If we ignored all the details like lumpiness of capital, discount rates, and all these critical things, everyone should be doing this today. But of course, we don't for lots of reasons. That's a lot of money to put up front, et cetera. One version of everything I've described is that California has what I would now call an incredibly dense set of interacting laws. This is something we didn't have when we started to think about this process before. And it's something that the international process around climate doesn't have. We have aggressive standards requiring low carbon fuels, aggressive standards requiring um, uh, us to have clean electricity. We have a requirement in California, for example, that by 2020, we have a million Elect solar uh, rooftops, so a million uh, PV systems on residential properties, and a million electric vehicles in use in the state. Obviously, some of those will be the same, but not necessarily all of them. We have targets that a third of our electricity in 2020 will be renewables, uh, will be come from renewables, and that excludes um, large hydro, and it excludes nuclear. And right now in this draft report I mentioned, California is debating what will be this new standard for 2030. And the leading candidate right now, although this is much in debate, is somewhere between 45 and 51% of electricity will come from solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, plus the energy that comes from nuclear, if there are some left, and from hydro. Um, and so we have a whole series of standards that individually interact with each other. It is a dense network of policies. And a few places, Portugal, California, Korea, have this dense network. But that is, that is, by fault, that is the exception, not the norm. So it's a really interesting, different way to think about the mixture of things going on. An example of the kinds of innovations that come out of this process are if the price of solar panels is dropping, as you saw on the curve, what do we do to beat down the cost of everything else in the system? And so one of my favorite examples is, uh, is, is a story that two graduates of our business school came into my office one day and said, well, why is it that you guys who study solar are so stupid? That's not really a normal beginning of a conversation. Um, but they, they, they highlighted that they came out of, they were both Bell Labs graduate, they're both Bell Labs employees who then went to business school. And what they noticed is that the solar panels, which were and still are expensive, so we try to minimize them by having high efficiency panels, and the inverter that takes the direct current out of the solar panels and makes alternating current, are both expensive <coughs> devices. And because of that, you try to minimize the numbers of them. You try to minimize the number of solar panels by having efficient ones. You try not to have them shaded or in the way, but you invariably get them um, on rooftops to be shaded. And that these, this power electronics was very expensive. Well, the innovations that have made cell phones, what do I just do? Hmm. That is not what I'm seeing on my computer here. That's quite interesting. 
Sorry about that. I don't quite know why that happened. Let's mirror displays again and see if we can fix that little problem. So these um, innovators came into the, my office and said, well, let's fix that problem. Why don't we take the guts out of a cell phone? Because this, of course, does AC, uh, DC to AC. Let's have a system where each panel has its own inverter. And because of that same learning curve that drove down the cost of solar panels I talked about, with all the cell phones in use, if each one had the guts of the cell phone on the back, each panel could produce AC power. And electrical engineers in the room will recognize right away the really interesting part of that story is that if one of the panels is shaded in a series circuit, it impacts the amount of power that comes out of the whole loop. But if each panel sends AC power, it doesn't matter if this one is shaded because of a chimney or there's bird poop on this one or one of them had a softball crash into it. Um, and so you get much more output out of the whole system, especially under non-ideal conditions. So this is the output, if I can make it work here, because it's not, it's not what I expected there. This is the output of my roof on a given day where each of my solar panels has, um, has its own inverter. And you can see there's a huge range. The maximum output of each one of my panels is 160 watts. This one is shaded by a very ornery uh, willow tree and a chimney. And so you get this really large range in output. But by having each one send AC power, you don't lose what you would get by having basically trying to spill the electricity from one panel to the next. This company, Enphase, has found, and I, if I could ramp this down, I could show you a little movie of our house. This is a data feed we get every 15 minutes. I'm just going to run through each day here. Sorry, they're a little bit of off screen. So we had, we had some really rainy days, our first rain in a while in California, some of you may know. Now it's sunny again. Um, and so this is just running through uh, quickly, running over the last seven days. And you can see the output. And if you really have good, fast eyes, you can see some of the panels rise differently than others. And so you can see that we have this nice real-time output. And what we have found um, in this company is that on average for a regular roof with trees and things and clouds, that we get 25% more output from the same solar panel by having them not interfering with each other. And the reason why we do it is because we moved away from this kind of traditional idea that we need a big central inverter that took all the power out of all the panels summed together. Now we get this kind of nice innovation from the world of information technology. And in fact, this company today has 40% of the entire market for inverters in the country because these two people who knew almost nothing about solar but knew a lot about information technology said, so why are you guys so stupid to put in these, overly, these, these overbuilt inverters? So it's an interesting example. I don't know why the neuroscience graduate program is popping up here, but we'll let that go. So this is was meant to be a quick example of thinking about the system of energy and not just the individual components. And so what I'll try to conclude with is just a couple highlights of what we've now tried to do to really play up the story. So we've built a series of models that the electrical engineers in the room will know of as capacity expansion models. What that is is a model that models every power plant, every transmission line, and then plans out how much energy you're going to need. And because the amount of energy you need during the day varies dramatically, in California often a factor of two, between the daytime peak and the nighttime low, so much so that there are power plants in California that pay the system to take energy away because they, have, they can't ramp down their generation, such as our Iranian nuclear plant. We have now built versions of this model for Western North America, a model that's now used by 15 of the 20 Western states. We're building a version for Nicaragua. We built a version for Chile, a fascinating case. Um, we're right now building a version for the emerging East African cooperative power pool. We have a version for China, but this, the data is a complicated story that I've talked to uh, Denise about and some of her students. We have a model for the Malaysian part of Borneo. And what these models do is basically do a big, gory optimization. I won't go into the details because we're at four, five, uh, 29. And we basically look at the cost of generating energy, 
10, 20, 30 years in the future with a whole range of assumptions. The cost of natural gas, the cost of uranium, um, how much climate change may impact the amount of hydropower that's available. And again, without going into the details, I'd be happy to send the papers. You can actually just go to, if you uh, Google my name and switch, or just my laboratory rail, dot berkeley.edu slash switch, you'll get to be pictures that show wind, solar is yellow, um, geothermal is red, uh, nuclear is uh, purple on here, gas is gray, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what you find is an inter interesting feature, and that is if, Massive if, if we could coordinate the building of transmission that's needed and where we deploy power plants, what we find is that, Calif that all of the West, not just California, could meet its clean energy targets, of which California has, but none of our neighbors do. Um, we could meet those targets not in 2050, but in 2030 with a trivial difference in cost from what we expect to be any, anyway. Now, the if there is huge. The if is if the organizations that authorized and financed transmission projects and the groups that finance power plants basically had to be under a benevolent or a, uh, or a Rob Socolow dictator who told everyone what to do in this regard. Um, and it's interesting because we look at what would happen as the price of carbon would rise in the system. Um, coal gets squeezed out, no surprise. Gas initially expands while the price of carbon is low. As the price of carbon rises, gas then contracts and solar and wind grow more. And in this case, nuclear grows outside California. In fact, we knew the model was working because we said you can't build nuclear in California. And when we ran the model with a high price on carbon, our model promptly built 15 nuclear power plants in Tijuana. So they could all sell the power into California. I was pretty comfortable the model was working, although not realistic at that, at that point. What's really critical about this story is that this is six different scenarios where there are base scenarios where nuclear is cheap, where gas is cheap, where gas is expensive, all of which get to the same goal. If you knew your goal and if you could coordinate your infrastructure, both generation and transmission, investing reasonably in efficiency, um, that the price of carbon you would need are numbers that we don't say easily in Washington, D.C., but the price of power is remarkably constant. What's variable is that you build more, you invest more in transmission or generation, depending if you need to send transmission lines out to those huge solar farms in the middle of the desert. So what this highlights to me is that there's a whole range of options that get to interesting places. In fact, the first time we, we developed and built this model and we look in detail at the mix of power and if you're a power engineer you look at a world like this where there's all this oscillating amount of solar ramps up and ramps down, hydro is used, gas comes up and down, storage is used extensively in California as a rule requiring storage. None of this is stuff that a traditional utility thinks is the world that they're used to managing because they're used to very steady base load amounts of coal or nuclear, geothermal or hydro, but we see ways to meet this future, but the whole system is much more dynamic, i.e. smart grids, smart power plants, smart operators, all of which are ifs, would require to put this all together. California developed a rule to require a certain amount of storage as a percentage of the amount of energy we need to incentivize us to build out the thing we think we'll need to use next. There are debates whether we should build new storage technology like compressed air, whether we should have batteries or flywheels, or whether we should forget all those and invest in capturing carbon and just bury it underground and can use a fossil fuel. All of those are options that we find can work in this kind of mix. Meeting these targets, however, requires thinking holistically about the target, which we are remarkably bad at. One of the places where we applied this picture early on was to think about what's going on in Chile, which is a fascinating case study because the data on the Chilean grid is very extensive and President Bachelet is very interested in environmental issues and the Chilean grid exists as four non-interacting pieces. So the first thing that comes out of running the model for Chile is that they would save money if they integrated the grids. One of the big debates in Chile, for those who knows, is there's a project 
uh, to build Hydrosen, a huge hydroelectric power plant far in the south, and send the power all the way to the north along transmission lines. And so um, there's pictures of what it would look like if one took beautiful parts of Patagonia right now and flooded them out and basically did what we did in California when we flooded Hetch Hetchy. And so there are pictures of what the impacts would be. And we find that if you coordinated the grids and used the available local, not far away, solar, wind, geothermal, in addition to what they already have now, this project is not needed. So it's an interesting example of using these kinds of systems. Let me conclude with just two minutes on the other extreme to kind of highlight systems level thinking, what you get out of that. And then something incredibly mundane, but very interesting in terms of thinking through the other part of the story. So those of you who saw um, the Simpsons movie know that in that movie, President Schwarzenegger um, said, I was paid to lead, not to read. Um, only the students maybe uh, get that. But um, in that version, uh, one of the things that came out of the actual conversation that was quoted in the Simpsons movie was he asked a number of us, what do we do to build tools so that individuals can think through their current emissions and what they might do differently? And I wasn't really keen on doing this at first um, because I thought, OK, these carbon footprint calculators look at the amount of, of energy you use, how intensive the carbon is, whether you're using coal or natural gas. And then you add up the amount of carbon for your vehicle. We've highlighted like your vehicles and maybe the amount of carbon involved in moving your food, et cetera. And it looked interesting, but it looked like a piece of bookkeeping. Um, well, I was dead wrong. So we received funding from a number of Silicon Valley groups and from the governor's office to build the calculator. It has the, again, California-centric name, the coolcalifornia.org website. And there are calculators on here for individuals, for businesses, local governments, schools, communities and you can go in and do your carbon audit. So you go in and you say, are you a vegetarian? Are you a vegan? Are you a meat eater? Do you, do you drive to work? Do you telecommute, et cetera? And you go through and do your budget. Um, and I picked one where we got a happy face icon at the end. What it does is after you've done your carbon audit for yourself or your family, it then tells you, here are the next 20 things that you didn't do that we have in our database and what they would cost or benefit you in terms of carbon and in terms of dollars and whether they're upfront costs or things you can pay off over time. There are utilities that allow you to do on-bill financing of various things. So we built this calculator and it turned out, and I probably should have figured out if I listened to my social science colleagues, that this would be wildly interesting to people because you can go in and you can be nosy. You can go in and do your audit, and you can compare yourself to your neighbors, um, and you can compare yourself by zip code and various things. And so we released a version of this story recently in a paper with the uh, um, quite inflammatory title, The Spatial Distribution of U.S. Household Carbon Footprints Reveals That Sub Suburbanization Undermines the Greenhouse Gas Benefits of Urban Cores. Dense urban cores with good policies around congestion pricing or more efficient smaller homes per person for the same level of income have less energy use and hence less carbon than bigger um, you know, houses on stair McHome, McMansions, whatever they're called, in suburbs. So we did this analysis. The kilowatt hours of electricity per zip code the amount of natural gas used, this is a zip code level uh, data aggregation. Fuel oil by zip code. Greenhouse gas emissions, this is for, um, your, for, your, for your housing. Transportation, goods, services, and food. And you'll notice that despite the fact that California tells a good story, we have some of the most carbon intensive food production on the planet because we don't have water where we grow a lot of that food. One version of this story that stands right out, for example, if you, if you look at New York, is that Plan NYC, many of you have, have read it and contributed to it, wonderfully green, low-carbon urban core, but suburbs like where my, where my parents-in-law live out in, um, um, out in White Plains where there is a big carbon shadow. And so very greenhouse gas, smart plans for urban cores often by convenience, leave out all of that suburban mess and sprawl around them. So I'll just zoom in right here on that overall picture and then maybe do one to a bunch of, maybe 
make fun of a bunch of cities. So Chicago, dense urban core, low carbon but huge uh, carbon shadow. Same thing for San Francisco, New York, Dallas. And so we found that putting the combination of this data online and the carbon footprint tool allowed people and companies to both compare themselves to their immediate neighbors, but also to start thinking about the plan of cities. And so one of the most interesting questions that I was encouraged to think about when I was a junior faculty here was actually something that Julian Wolpert asked me over and over again. And he said, what is the optimal size of cities? So one interesting theoretically motivated question is, what is that optimal size, not just based on greenhouse gases, but greenhouse gases prove to be an interesting metric to look back at what are the ways that we would evaluate the amount of infrastructure you need per population. There are cities that have multiple downtowns dividing up the transport distances. Portland that's invested dramatically not only in mass transit, but also in sectioned mass transit to connect residential areas with areas that provide services has the lowest car ownership per capita of any US city. And it's not by accident. It's because they thought through some of these issues. And so I'll end here, because I know I've gone past our scheduled time. But there's lots and lots of cool data issues. But these highlight lots of questions about how much can we learn about how sustainable or not we are, but how much can understanding sustainability contribute back to other questions like the livability of cities. And so those of you who read Jane Jacobs know that this was a question paramount in her mind. Um, and I'm sort of now trying to think about how we can use this theoretical question to get us back to make the greenhouse gas story that much more relevant overall. I've gone up beyond time. I apologize. Thank you very much. And I'll stop there. Well, I have 95 more slides, and so let's go from there. Um, why don't you go ahead and take your own questions? I think you Sounds good. Questions. Bob? Uh, very nice. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks. I have a, uh, a, a, a broad policy question for you, and, and it relates to uh, the relative policy strength in California and the mm. European Union, both of which have been very aggressive in Rules, but uh, there is a uh, uh, currently a lot of pushback in, in, in Europe, and I, you don't seem to see that in California. And I can think of three possible reasons for that, and I'd like you to comment on what mix of those three it might be. And in, in the first difference is that the renewables, renewables uh, promotion programs in Europe have been primarily feed in tariffs. Right. And in California, you have both the uh, uh, renewable fuel standard and the re renewable portfolio standard and the low carbon fuel standard. But you also have these much more complex set of policies that probably, that probably characterize much of Europe. And then on the other hand, the uh, renewable resources are also much, more much better yeah. in, in California than in the European Union. And I wonder if you could comment on why you're not seeing this pushback in California and, and how those different factors might play out in, in that regard. And then also, do you expect any pushback in the future? Right. So the second, let me start with the second one, because that's the easiest. We will certainly see pushback. One of the reasons I would argue we haven't seen it yet in California is that the rules are relatively newer in California. And so the prices haven't risen as much. I also think, however, the prices are not likely to rise as much. Electri uh, electricity in Europe is very expensive. And much of the argument in Germany in, Germany in particular and, and in the UK um, is that we are overpaying for energy. We can't be competitive. The day that uh, the European Union, the commission chaired by Connie Hedegaard, came out with this much, much watered down next plan, um, there were editorial after editorial in every major European pa paper by some big industrial saying, we can't compete not only with China, nor can we compete with the US because our electricity is so many times more expensive. Well, part of that is, is the first point, that I think we will see more pushback later. But California 
has seen some significant pushback. There was a uh, proposition, those of you who know the California process know it's ugly about how propositions can be managed, uh, but there was a Proposition 23 to undo 32, um, and it was defeated 60% in favor of keeping the climate bill, 40% against, at the height of the recession. California had the worst rate of homes going underwater, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't just liberal, affluent people living in a few suburbs. It was resoundingly supported. Now, part of that is that at that point, uh, some of the key more recent features hadn't come into effect. In particular, this was in 2008, and California's carbon price only came into effect last year. However, California's carbon price, different than both the ETS in Europe and in Reggie, uh, I would say here, but you guys decided to pull out, and we'll leave, leave that for you all to sort out with your governor and others. Um, but California has a cap and trade system which keeps a lot of people comfortable feeling that you can buy credits and there should be cheap credits available, but California's market for carbon has both a price floor and a price ceiling. So it's not actually that much different than a carbon price, which many of us, myself, very strongly included, think is where we have to go ultimately, because it looks like we're trading, there is a market, there's auctions, everything, but the band is quite limited and the price floor rises fairly steadily. And there is a mechanism, should the price of carbon spike in California, there's a mechanism to release a limited number of credits short term to damp down the fear, but not to change the overall trajectory. So I think that partially by luck, but partially by looking at what happened in the Northeast and, and in Europe, California's program ultimately is designed to transition to a price of carbon. But in the short term, the individual sectoral policies, that's why I spent so much time illustrating these, all these different policies, those pieces collectively mean that there's insurance in each of the individual areas. And so there's a variety of pieces of that picture of which I'm a huge fan, um, one of which that doesn't get a lot of discussion outside of the nerdy policy wonk community is that one thing California has is decoupling. And decoupling is probably my favorite policy tool that is really an inside uh, baseball kind of thing. And what it says is that for like for utilities and only California for other states have decoupling in place um, and for both electricity and gas, what it says is that a utility forecasts how much electricity is going to sell and when their estimate is vetted by the state regulator, then they get told, okay, you estimate you're going to sell this many kilowatt hours at this price, your profit's a billion dollars. If they sell more electricity than the forecast amount, and there's corrections of a bad weather year and all kinds of details, if they sell more electricity than forecast, they receive a lower price per kilowatt hour. If they sell less kilowatt hours, they receive more per kilowatt hour so that their revenue is guaranteed at that billion dollars a year. And that policy is one of my favorites because what it does is it actually requires the energy generator to be a generator also of knowledge because they need to forecast and think through the process and selling less is a way to save and to make the same amount of money. And that type of thinking isn't just in this one particular policy, this decoupling. It is part of what goes on in all the different areas. So, I think that we will be able to contain this process quite well, but the problem facing California is something else, and that is that as of this point, no neighboring state has adopted policies that are, that are commensurate. And so right now our problem is California is 2% of global emissions, and there will be some price rise over time, whether it's small or large, but unless our neighbors chime in, it's not going to matter because eventually we'll have leakage of money or companies or carbon because people will play arbitrage around state borders. So we have not done much about this. Recently, a candidate for governor in California convened a meeting where the governor of California, the premier of British Columbia, British Columbia also has a carbon price, although it's only on the marginal units. It's kind of a strange carbon price, but it's a nice one, um, met as well as the governors of Washington, Oregon. Both states 
had tried to get enact legislation like California in the past. Both states had failed. Governor Inslee is, was one of the leading lights, a colleague of Congressman Holtz um, in, the, in the Congress before he became governor, um, an eloquent speaker for green jobs, et cetera, but we don't have any partners to deal with. In fact, bizarrely, California's only official partner right now is Quebec, which makes absolutely no sense. Quebec should be a partner of you guys here. So my worry is that if we don't infect our neighbors in a positive way, all of this nice, dense coupling goes away. Yeah. You said that low carbon biofuels, if they exist, what do you mean by that? Oh, okay. So, long story, and Princeton has been central in this, in, in this effort. Um, the initial assessment of biofuels in terms of the energy content of the fuel and the energy required to make the biofuels is something that a number of us have studied in detail. In fact, my lab did a project on this in 2006. The only day in my life I've been called by the advisor to both presidential candidates in the same day. I had a bad paper. was on this paper we wrote um, about the role that biofuels could play in our future. And the conclusion was that if you only looked at the direct cradle-to-grave impact of biofuels, that even Midwestern corn could be less greenhouse gas intensive than gasoline. But there were a lot of ifs. And there were types of corn-based ethanol that would not qualify. And then came um, um, uh, Mr. Searchinger, who is here at Princeton, and colleagues in Minnesota and elsewhere. And they said, well, your analysis left at a critical part of the story. And that is, you don't just grow this biofuel on land that you happen to find lying around with nothing going on. If you, for example, indirectly cause tropical forests to be cut down, say, I'm a farmer in the Amazon and I see that people are getting out of the food business, and so even if I'm not growing biofuels, but I cut down primary rainforest, what impact would that lost standing carbon be? Turns out that if you do this in kind of some of the worst possible ways, it would take f up to four centuries of growing the biofuel to make up for that carbon that was standing. And so this if is a big if. And so one of our projects at Berkeley was to work in, con in, in conjunction with the University of Illinois to win a $500 million competition that BP put out to host a biofuel institute. That institute is working intensively on a few flavors of biofuels of which they think look promising. But this land use story doesn't go away. And so there are some places where using, for example, native grasses in the upper Midwest can produce a very low carbon uh, form of biofuels. But if you do the basic physics analysis, it's very hard to find any liquid fuel that you might want to lug around in your car that looks better than turning that amount of biomass into electricity. And locally at the source, not transporting it and worrying about pipelines and things, and putting that electricity or hydrogen derived from electricity into your car. And so the, the, the unfortunate part of the story is that what this means is that to evaluate you know, whether this container of ethanol is good for your car requires you to assess a whole set of non-observables. And so while scientifically this low carbon fuel standard that actually we wrote in our lab uh, is, a, is a good thing in theory, it may be unenforceable in practice. And so I, if, that's one of the things I mentioned at the beginning, we've made some blunders. The low carbon fuel standard is being pushed in some nice ways, but it is problematic. Because if you can't observe what you're telling companies, how can you really be fair? So that's what I meant. It's a hard story. So I have a, a, a kind of... The, Two questions about the last uh, slides that you were showing about emissions from city cores and suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, well, my f I mean, the first question is how would the picture look like in Europe for mm -hmm. European cities where we don't have that much suburbanization? And the second and related question is how much of this large footprint of the suburbs is related to the fact that power production and other activities that go to basically support the urban core are actually now in the suburbs, industries, power production. Yeah. And the third, I guess, the third question is if, if you took all the suburbs in the United States and um, uh, merged them into 
urban cores or one ta and, and uh, I mean how much uh, CO2 emissions would, would, would we save? So we, so let me start with the last one because it's a great series of questions. We don't have an answer to many of those because we don't have the counterfactual of what if you did put them together, are there ways to organize the urban landscape? You now, when you, for those of you who come from or work in China know that you can be right in the middle of a residential area and there is a small coal-fired power plant, your physical next door neighbor, right? So there are ways to distribute both fossil and renewable uh, infrastructure that might change that equation pretty dramatically. The electricity production itself is definitely part of the story, but what dominates this picture in U.S. cities, not necessarily in Europe, is transportation. And not just transportation of you driving to work or not. It's also the delivery of food and services to your home. And so it's a bigger story. And so what we're doing in the next part of this is to try to tease this apart. So we have colleagues at NTNU in Norway. It's actually a Princeton grad named Edgar Hertvich. And we are doing a project right now to compare. We're going to just start off with Trondheim and Tromso and San Francisco and Minneapolis for reasons that have to do with funding to start with an examination of those issues and go from there. What we are seeing, and I don't, I think they're in here, but I won't, is that we are now looking at some cities that have very, very detailed urban planning. So Davis has won several most sustainable city in California awards and looking at individual plots much more fine scale than just a zip code. And that's all I showed you here because that's all we have the data for. The next version is to do census tracts. And census tracts will allow us to get much more of the issue you're talking about. That is, how do you compare the living patterns in Europe and U.S. cities so we can get at a much more fine-grained level. But the broadest message that transportation, not only of people, but of goods and services, is a critical part of this equation we're going to have to, to tease apart, is probably the frontier where we can try to answer that question. And then how distributed do you want your energy generation to be because one benefit is you get this more distributed, hopefully more robust system, but then you also put pollution closer to people. And for fossil generation, that's going to be a big problem. And so we're looking right now at how we're going to assess that story. And so we'll be coming to ask Denise and others who do the air quality side of that story. So it's an open piece. And so we just put this paper out uh, about three weeks ago. And so we're right now digesting the next round. So great question for next time. Actually, I've, I was told that that was the last question, but I just want to make one addition um, to this um, idea here, which is that it would be interesting to look at developing countries, where if you look yeah, at sure. China right now, the agricultural rural regions are very low emitters, right. and the suburban areas are actually not too different, but the urban centers per capita emissions are much, much larger. And so as the rest of the world yeah. urbanizes, it'll be interesting to see how this kind of mapping right. would evolve in other parts of the world. Yeah. So one version is this version that, that, that Edgar and I are going to do together. But the other version that I mentioned at the beginning, this Fulbright program partnering the US and Brazil as the two hubs, we've already decided to morph one of these project areas based on interest. And so we will do both planned and unplanned Brazilian cities. So Brasilia and some small Amazonian towns. And we will be doing some places in the Pacific Northwest as a version to get there. But this is a, I mean, this is classic big data project right now. So that's the next frontier to figure out which of these things we can really tease apart. So great question. Sorry I can't answer it yet. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. For yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you.